Hello. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all. Uh, yeah, so I'm Greg McNeely. I'm the head of CG at Electric Theatre Collective. And I was fortunate enough to be the creative director and CG lead on this project that we're going to discuss today, which is Pharrell Williams' Cash In, Cash Out, which is an interesting project. It had a very strange journey getting to where it did, and so it'll be interesting for you guys to follow along. I'll uh, just test my clicker. Right. So, uh, Electric Theatre Collective is uh, an award-winning visual effects company, started in 2007 and has grown in size and in scope to become one of the leading visual effects and animation companies in the world. Uh, we've done feature films, TV shows, lots of commercials, loads of music videos, and, uh, and recently, this particular music video which was awarded a black pencil, the first visual effects black pencil in history, which was great for us, and we're really grateful to DNAD and to, of course, everyone who worked on it. Today, uh, ETC is kind of growing and changing. We're reacting to a changing industry and starting to engage with new technologies, also to engage with long-form visual effects, which is a huge and growing area. Um, as well as commercials and music videos. So let's, let's take a look at this project in, in particular. So, cash in, cash out. Maybe I can see, yeah, good. So for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a fully animated music video that is featuring Pharrell Williams, Tyler the Creator, and 21 Savage. Uh, it is based around the idea of a zoetrope, which is this, I'll go into it in detail, but it's a, the original animation machine, right? Where you see multiple copies of the same image, all at different frames of an animation, but you can only see one at a time because it spins and you look through a little slit. And through the slit, you see one frame at a time and it creates this illusion of motion. It's one of the first animation bits of tech. And it's a sort of Victorian 19th century device. This is a three-dimensional zoetrope, so all the different frames of the animation are little statues around a big circular kind of cake. And as you spin it, it springs to life. So we'll watch it. And there you can see the size of the team that worked on it at ETC. So, a little concept and context for this. This project came to us in March 2020. We had a call from the director, Francois Rousselet, saying that he had an idea, he pitched it to Pharrell, and Pharrell was into it. And would we like to get involved? Could we do a test? So we were really excited about it. We saw the initial ideas, saw some zoetropes, thinking this is gonna be great. But the catch was, it was March 2020, and everyone was suddenly not allowed in the office anymore. There was no hope of filming any, uh, anyone, really, for the foreseeable future. There was no chance of getting any reference of the stars, and we essentially were inventing a new remote animation pipeline uh, at that time. So it was a strange time, and that led to this project having, there were a number of things that led to it, but. Basically, this project took a bit longer. So it's March 2020, and now we're all watching it and seeing it in the awards now. It had a period of working on it, then a period of hiatus, another period of working on it, and another break, and then a final push. And this was largely due to changes, the label side, where they had different artists involved, and then they changed the artists, uh, which, as you can imagine, with a project like this, where everything is in the background of everything else, Changing one of the characters is a big, big task. Um, but because of that, we had a little bit more time. And that is actually a very interesting thing in our industry right now. We are living in a world where you can literally order the most obscure item and get it delivered that day. And this time pressure and urgency of everything is permeating all of the creative industries right now. Everyone's really stretched, uh, or compressed, you might say. Editors, directors, creatives, 
and visual effects and post houses, definitely, where we're having less time to do work and expected to do the same quality or better. So it's a challenging situation, and this is an example of a project that had a little bit more time, and what can happen when you have that bit of extra time to consider your response. It didn't necessarily have more money, but it did have more time. Uh, so, zoetropes. The zoetrope, as I say, is this original animation machine. You've got all the different frames of your animation in a loop. You see them one at a time as you look through the slit, as, it, as, the, as the cylinder rotates. This creates the illusion of motion, and the number of frames determines the length of the loop. For us, we went for a two-second loop. That's 24 different frames seen at 12 frames per second. So like a Wallace and Gromit film, for example, is offered 12 frames per second. That's the minimum you can get to where you still see it as persistence of vision, the consistent movement of one character rather than a set of still juddering images. 3D zoetropes. So there have been a couple of them made. This, you know, the Pixar one, and there's a Studio Ghibli one. They're very special, and they were built physically. They spin, they hit it with a strobe light, exactly the right speed, and suddenly this magical thing comes to life. This was the reference we started with. And so immediately, to be able to win the job, we started to do some tests. So we had to learn the rules of the zoetrope. How do we... Uh, how many frames should we use? How do we add this kind of physical judder to it as if each individual statue was placed by hand so that it would be slightly offset from the other one or slightly texturally different from the other one? And that, these are some of the early tests we did and they look terrible when I look back at them, but um, there certainly was a lot of learning going on there. We also looked at sort of early filmmaking, Moybridge stuff, trying to think about breaking motion down into a set of frames and to create that real filmed uh, imperfection, really. And essentially, one of the briefs from the very beginning of this was, well, we can't film anyone. It has to be fully CG, but it has to be completely realistic. It must be totally realistic. And in the end, we're, I think we did a great job with it, and there was a lot of... Uh, confusion when it first came out, thinking that it was actually stop motion, which I guess was part of the goal. These are some motion tests that were done once we'd had, the, this is a bit in the middle of the process, once we had the characters done. But you can see this kind of flicker and judder and textural difference on each frame that gives it this tactile, physical quality. So, traditionally with an animation project like this, you would start with a script and some storyboards. And the storyboards would help to define what's actually gonna be in each frame. And then you could realistically allocate time and artists and plan how long it's gonna take in the schedule to deliver each moment in the film. That just wasn't really possible on this project. If you look at this example from the recent Coca-Cola spot that we released, you'll see, well, here's a storyboard sketch. Here's a guy, he's in, the, he's in the gallery. He's looking up, we're seeing a bit of the ceiling, okay. Then we developed it in previs. We've got a plan, we've got a basic model. Then they went and shot it, and we could all kind of work out what's gonna be in each shot and how, it's gonna, how long it's gonna take us to achieve it. So with this project, where everything is based on, all the shots are based on what we see, which includes absolutely every scene, and how much of that scene are we gonna see at any one time, we couldn't really storyboard it at all. It was totally impossible. We had to nail the layout first and figure out where everything was gonna go, do the animation loops, figure out what was gonna work in two seconds, then figure out where it would sit in the physical zoetrope. The first sort of backbone of the, of the piece was this illustration from the director, Francois Rousselet, where you can see the different scales of the characters and you can see the placement within this structure. And what you're looking at is a sideways slice through one of the you know, pizza slices of the zoetrope. We then took this and worked on all the animation loops, 
which we were developing concurrently, auditioning them for the director, and essentially created this three-dimensional slice. And you can see here, it's a kind of one twenty-fourth of a circle. And each copy of the zoetrope is the same as this, except that the elements are slightly different, as they're different frames of animation. This is a little demonstration of the assembling of the zoetrope itself. Starting with the first slice. There are about 2,360 individual objects. To be able to achieve this, we built a system in Houdini to take all our animations and offset them into, in time around the zoetrope. And then we created, essentially, one big 3D model. It wasn't a set of animations, it was just one big static model. And then when I spun it around at the right speed, this is a low-res version of it, kind of a low-polygon version, that we could spin at the right speed in the 3D scene and essentially see the whole thing come to life. And we could use that to animate cameras around and find ways of telling the story, which was how we pre-visualized it instead of storyboarding it. There was talk at one point of actually building the thing for real. Pharrell was really into it at first, and uh, they're still talking about it occasionally. Uh, to do it at the scale we built it, it would be approximately five and a half meters wide, so that sort of scared a few people. Even though all, all the characters are kind of 10 centimeter miniatures, it's so massive because of the amount of stuff that's crammed in there. Here's a little top view. So here we see an example of the, the sort of moment where it spins. It's a motion blurred sort of mush. And then the strobe light comes on. And suddenly, you see all singing, all dancing, 3D characters in motion. But it was a journey to get to that point. And we had to find some references and think about how can we break this creative down. It was a real challenge because essentially we didn't get much reference from the artists. Uh, it was the height of lockdown and we got a few kind of snaps taken by their friends in their houses or sort of little tiny video clips that they filmed themselves. And it was great for personality reference but didn't provide much actual animation reference. Um, but we did find these examples, like these sort of resin maquettes. We knew this would be a nice look for us to try to feature. The characters were developed and eventually sent to the, to the artists, and they fed back. For example, Tyler, the creator, asked to have a version of himself on the body of a female dancer. Um, and Pharrell was very keen to see himself as a sort of little miniature action figure. There's a real art to miniaturization, stylization, and, uh, and the challenge is if you make it too different from the original person, which we had to sculpt all of these things by hand, essentially. Um, if you make it too different from the original person, then you don't get the recognition of who it is. Uh, and if you make it too close to a real person, you find yourself squarely in the middle of the uncanny valley where everything just looks a little bit awkward and wrong. So we tried to create a kind of recognizable but stylized miniature feeling for each character. Tyler, the creator, was the last person to join the project after several other artists had been part of the project and then left. Uh, and so I think our, our technique and technology was at its peak when we did his character design. To achieve the performance, we studied loads of references. We would receive these uh, many, many page documents from the director with loads of GIFs like this, saying, what if they were doing this and this? And can you smush them together and fit it into two seconds? And we would do our best and try it out. And then we would either succeed or fail. There were quite a few animation loops that didn't make it into the film. but. Uh, some of them did, and some of them uh, were you know, based on things just like this. 
we often also had images, strong images like this one. We thought, this is a strong moment. Let's see if we can craft an animation based on this. There were also uh, references the director provided that were not from the artists themselves, but just from the history of animation. And we tried to conjure those. This is a very clear example where we've got these references here. And then here you see the final version of it in the film. Pharrell asked if he could be on a BMX. And so there's this set of BMX scenes in the film. Uh, interestingly, 21 Savage said he was not going to be on a BMX. No way. Uh, and so we had to change, change, change. But it turns out he does like being on a motorized dirt bike, so it was okay. To achieve the animation, as I say, we had some reference, but we had to find or generate our own references. And here you see lead animator Fabrice Fateni being Tyler the Creator in his sitting room. And this is often something that we do. You know, ETC is a real animation studio. We, we pride ourselves on really throwing all our energy into capturing, capturing uh, you know, a performance or a character. And a lot of that comes down to the performance of the animators and their ability to translate a character to the screen through 3D animation. You see the rough 3D animation on the right there and the final thing in the middle. Another thing we often did was we thought we'd find a little bit of performance that we really loved. This Tyler, the creator, is a phenomenal mover. There's a moment from his uh, live show where what we're doing here essentially is taking a moment of action and then trying to bring it back to itself so that it becomes a two-second loop. And sometimes there was no reference, there was no anything. We just had to kind of conjure their persona through pure animation. And this is a lovely example of it. As I say, there were quite a few loops that didn't make it into the film. It was a, an option with the suitcases. The suitcases were a request from Tyler as well. He says he has a very large Louis Vuitton suitcase collection and could it please feature in the film? There were a lot of strange suggestions over the sort of two years that this project was on and off, including at one point everyone was wearing masks, then the masks went away, which is good. Uh, and then at some point people were throwing toilet paper rolls at each other because there was all these toilet paper riots in the States and they were like, we've got to get the toilet paper in. But thankfully that also got removed. One interesting thing we learned as we kind of got our heads into this whole zoetrope thing is that it's possible with a bit of trickery to get a four second loop. So what you're seeing here is essentially a piece of action that takes four seconds, but it's made of two two second loops. But you see the character twice. So you're following one character going all along, but actually what you're looking at is two two-second loops that happen to replace each other. And we use this several times in the film, the sort of Incredible Hulk character and the guys on the bikes riding along uh, are all four-second loops. So a lot of this film is about the framing of the, of the of shots, essentially. And the cinematography was done by myself and uh, ETC founder James Sindel. Once we'd built this pre-visualization version of the whole zoetrope, and we would essentially m fly cameras around in the space to try to create the shots. We made a lot of rules for ourselves because oftentimes just going free and flying a camera everywhere will make everything look really fake. And we realized, wow, Let's, let's break the rules a little bit, but let's try to establish some rules. How would we really film this if it was, there, if it was actually physically there? With simple camera moves, fixed set of lenses. And so you can sort of see this idea of, you know, a camera is just tracking around the thing as it spins. There certainly are cases where if we really had a camera there, it wouldn't have been physically possible, but we tried to make it physically plausible 
and that's part of why it feels kind of real. This is an example of the kind of thing that we gave to the director and the editor. This is a kind of, a, I don't know, eight or nine second clip that was from the sort of low res version and we would essentially create all these different shots of each scene and then they would build the story and edit from there. Here again is an example of the initial uh, pre-visualization version and the final shot with all the high detail meshes and subdivisions and textural differences in there. We found that if we kind of attached cameras to objects, it had a kind of realism to it, as if it was sort of attached to one vehicle or something in the, in the zoetrope. It gave it a kind of plausibility. And then again, there are certain times where we just flew the camera straight in to tell the story. And this, of course, would be completely impossible because the camera would be bashed out of the way by a giant spinning zoetrope. But in fact, it still has that feeling of being physically plausible, partially because it's a simple, elegant move. And it's really leveraging a lot of the shallow depth of field and uh, textural detail. On each frame, the character's textures kind of judder, as if each one is slightly different than the next. FX. FX in animation terms refers usually to things that are simulated uh, or just really complicated. Um, and in this project, the FX was all these little bits of cloth simulation so that the character's sort of clothing has a sort of slow moving clay like clothiness to it, little bits of fire, and of course the giant system itself which built the zoetrope. Here you can see some of this sort of bouncing gelatinous cloth. And here we've got some of this little bits of plastic resin like fire. Getting to one of my favorite areas is the lighting. So uh, I come from a sort of lighting background and, and so it was a real pleasure to, to dive into that on this project. It was also really challenging to try to find the right look. We started off with some references, which is basically what you want to start any kind of in creative endeavor with, is what are we talking about? Can we agree on something together that we like? It's a really, really useful way of interacting with clients, with the directors, with everybody. We can all buy in. To, well, at least we all know we like that. Or maybe we don't like that. Whatever it is, you've got to align yourselves creatively. And this was such a project about collaboration and trust because we needed so many different disciplines, the animators, the lighters, the compositors, the modelers, the, you know, the director, the artists, uh, as in the musicians, um, all had to kind of align on a few things. And so we had to trust each other to be able to achieve that because visual effects and animation and filmmaking in general is a collaborative art form and you can't do it really on your own. You can, of course, but the greatest work is born out of collaboration. These are some initial references that we found where we thought there's some really interesting things happening here lighting-wise. And essentially, we honed in on a lighting style, which I'm going to call two-tone lighting, which essentially was that we would use strong colors, particularly a strong wash in the background, and then we would light the assets from two sides with two contrasting colors, but we would not let them mix. So you'd have red on one side, blue on the other, but no pink and no purple in the middle. And that's just down to light placement, and that creates this kind of very strong, high contrast, uh, very uh, distinctive look. This was an early shot. It didn't make it into the film, actually, but it was an early shot that was in the film, and this was the first moment we thought, okay, I think we've actually cracked it. There's something really nice is gonna happen here. It looks like this could be really cool. And we saw uh, the shallow depth of field coming into play. We saw the texture and the judder and the movement. Here you're looking at essentially 
every frame, a frame from each shot in the film. And I think from a design perspective, from a color perspective, what you can see there is that there's some very strong color choices, but there's a very limited set of colors that we're working with. So each frame is very rich, very saturated and, and punchy, but it's got a very controlled color palette. This next slide shows a kind of transition from the grayscale model working its way up through towards lighting and into the compositing phase as the atmosphere is added in. As I say, this was such a collaborative project and for the animators trying to distill the performance of these, these musicians, the lighters trying to create this uh, holistic look that could also vary. It was a real challenge, especially on these wide shots. When we first said, we, you know, we nailed one scene, nailed another scene, we put them all together and looked at the whole thing and it looked like a giant Christmas tree and it was definitely not a hip hop music video vibe. It was not that cool. So we had to then come up with a new look that was essentially the wide look. But as I say, it was a real collaboration and the lighters were involved in discussing things with the animators and maybe this was partially because for the majority of the project we were all remote. So we'd have these massive Zoom calls where everybody would try to, you know, discuss things and it was a, an interesting and challenging period. I, uh, we now are more hybrid and enjoy being together in the office and collaborating there and also enjoy working remotely. But um, for this project, we were largely remote and there were benefits to that and challenges. We had to do a lot of sort of screen grabbing what you're working on and so that you could feel like you could share with people. Otherwise, essentially, you're in a silo working on your own thing. And one of the benefits of working with other artists in the same space is you can just look over at someone's desk and say, oh, you know what, I tried that last week and it didn't work, so, you know, don't waste your time. Or, or here's a trick I learned. And that doesn't work when you're all isolated. You never get it, unless you're constantly sort of spamming each other with screen grabs of your work. So that's what we tried to do. Compositing. So compositing, for anybody who doesn't know, compositing is the process after we do the 3D animation and lighting and render out a whole bunch of images with all these multiple layers and technical passes. The compositors bring it all together, blend the layers together, and it's provide this sort of final finish. And in this film, it was also adding kind of film-like detail. There could be a little kink in the weave of the film, judder, a bit of a flare, or, or a bit of blo something blowing out for a moment as the camera passes a light, adding all kinds of detail, and also really developing the depth of field, the shallow look where the background is, you know, used as a a texture because it's so out of focus it can sort of the foreground objects can really jump off at you and that's leading the eye that's one of the key things that we as artists have to learn to do is essentially where should the viewer be looking right now and if you're not defining that then who is because if it's your work and you're trying to lead them to have some sort of reaction you should think about where their eye is going to go not only just where is it going immediately, but what's the journey of it? Do they first look here and then think, oh wow, what's that over there? And then you end up where you want to be. And then maybe you cut to the next thing from that point. What's in the same place on the next shot where your eye just landed here and the next shot you arrive there, so what's next? This kind of visual storytelling is a huge part of our work. And it's something that people often don't teach. You just learn on the, on the job, essentially. But it's, but it's massively important. And the guiding the eye is a part of the lighting and compositing and overall framing of every piece that you make. Here's an example of our friend Tyler. And you can see the journey that the eye makes as you look at it. You maybe take the whole thing in and find your way up his body towards this sort of glint in the eye. As we look at this shot, you might see the flame and the fire and the face and then discover that there's a kind of upside down guy that he's holding. It's a kind of revealing uh, moment, essentially. And that's another part of the visual storytelling.
These are just some highlights from the film. And you can see the kind of textural fingerprints, the level of detail that was put in there to try to capture this tactile physical quality. This part of the talk will close out with a, a kind of breakdown video that shows a bit of the making of, kind of see some rigs and some textures and things like that. And then I've got a few other bits for you and uh, we'll take some questions, but let's have a look at this. One thing I forgot to mention in my chat about two-second loops, which is a real challenge, fitting a piece of story into a two-second loop. Obviously, lip sync, where someone's lip syncing for five seconds, doesn't fit into a two-second loop. So we had to come up with a way of breaking the rules. We established the rules, then we figured out a way of breaking the rules, and then we had to sort of take this little animated bit of geometry that was actually lip syncing that we sort of rather painstakingly set to the lip sync, uh, and then making it look like it was part of this looping world, which involved taking all that textural offset, all that frame by frame change, the judder each, each statue had, and applying it to a piece of animation. It was a technically challenging job. It was an extremely cool job to work on, and we had a brilliant time doing it. It was very great that the artists, the musicians were so creatively supportive of us. They trusted us to do, uh, once we'd gotten over the initial kind of figuring out, is it gonna look okay? They were completely brought in. The director the same way, it was a really great process working with him. He's very uh, particular, uh, very brilliant director, but also really entrusted us to, to make the work. And ETC invested in the project. You know, this project had a pretty good budget as music videos go, but it wasn't enough to make that film. Uh, we invested in it as an organization, and uh, it was maybe fortunate that it was kind of COVID lockdown and pe projects were a little bit more uncertain, and so we could say, we're going to put artists on this and essentially pay for their time, because we recognize it's a great piece of work and, you know, it's going to be do, do well for us. And I'm very fortunate that ETC, Electric Theatre Collective, is a kind of place that 
uh, is able to make that kind of investment in its artists and in, in its work. Let's chat about general career development for you, us all, basically, in film and animation. So a lot of this stuff is true in design uh, and other arts, uh, visual arts, musical arts. Just some sort of key ideas. First thing is, I would say, is learning. Everything is changing, especially in the technical aspect of arts. You know, all of these visual arts are essentially, you're mixing a technology with your visual skills. And the ability to learn is essential. What you're essentially doing in your studies is teaching yourself to learn. You're teaching yourself to be able to learn the next thing because you're going to learn, you're going to need to keep learning all through your career. Technology will change, styles will change, uh, what you're doing will change. You'll need to learn a new trick, a new technique, a new idea. The, each project provides opportunities to learn new ways of doing things or about a different subject area. Essentially, the ability to teach yourself and get yourself learning is vital. And I, I really can't can't uh, recommend it enough, the idea, always be learning. Dedication. You should try to be the best version of yourself in each situation you're in. You can't always be perfect. You can't always get everything right. You're going to make mistakes, we all do. But you can try to be the best version of yourself, given your circumstance and what you're trying to do. Give it your all, essentially then you won't feel like you've let yourself down. I mean, we always do. We have problems with that. I didn't quite, you know, present myself right there. That's fine. Just do your best to present and do the best version of you that you can do in that moment. That said, be patient. Have some self-compassion. It's a tricky industry. And there will be things we all have to overcome as we go forward. There'll be knocks to our ego. There'll be moments where it doesn't quite work out as, our, as according to our plan. And there's moments when it really will. And you should, you know, have faith in yourself, have compassion for yourself, and then you'll be able to leap ahead when the moment comes. So trust. I kind of touched on this um, during, the, during the talk. Film, animation, and visual effects, design to a lesser degree, but still is a collaborative art form. These are collaborative art forms. The best work comes from finding people you can trust to collaborate with. And to do that, you need to build trust by doing your best, enabling others to do their best, not trying to take over creatively. It's, it's, a, it's a conversation. And the best work comes from enabling each other to do the best part that, of the project that you can do, or that they can do. You earn trust through dedication and kindness and generosity of spirit, as well as brilliant execution of your work. And it's, you know, all of these things come together to allow you to do your best work that you can do, and also to develop the most trust with your colleagues, clients, friends, you know. Lastly, I'd say just go for it, really. Stay positive. Reach to exceed. And what, what I mean by that is that your reach should exceed your grasp. You can get here now, but that's not enough. You should be reaching beyond that creatively, technically, artistically, push yourself to get to the next thing. You can always do something better, essentially. Be proud of your work when you do excellent work, but think, how could I make this better? How much time have I got left? You know, when I work with artists who we say, okay, well, we've got a week left on this. They say, great, you know, I bet I can do this, 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 and this to make it better. That's the kind of attitude that, you, that gets you uh, big, fans, really, within the creative industries. Essentially, if you want to make it better always with whatever time, resource you have. So with that, I think I'll 
just say hello. Thank you. And I've got time for some questions, if anybody has any questions about anything, really. Thank you so much. It was a great sure. talk. Uh, so I have a question. You mentioned the strobe light. Yes. And I suppose you used the strobe light with a strand, uh, standard frame per second. Mm. Uh, what's the difference in between doing that or using 12 frames per second and continuous light? The strobe light is what you would use if you were to build it physically. Yeah. And if uh, you need to, because otherwise it's just spinning so fast that it's just a blur. The strobe locks everything at each frame. In the world of computer graphics, you don't need a strobe light. You just need to show it with no motion blur at 12 frames per second, which is what we did. So we rendered it at 12 frames per second, and we introduced kind of aspects of flaring and things in the light, but it wasn't really actually done with a strobe. And for example, in my previous scene, where I had this three-dimensional object that was rotating, to try to recreate it, and I could move the cameras around. It was rotating with what's called a stepped keyframe. And a stepped keyframe means rather than a smooth curve interpolating rotation, it was just jumping every frame to the next. Right, so it's going tick, 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 tick. But at the right speed and creating the illusion of motion. Thank you. So you talked a lot about collaboration. Um, I just wanted to ask, what have you seen get in the way of collaboration in your experience? And then maybe some advice of how we can get through that to be able to work better together. Absolutely. Uh, certainly, it's a, it can be one of the challenges for us all. Um, you know, you might call it ego clash, you know, basically, which is when you've got two people who aren't able to align or more than two people who aren't able to align. We often find ourselves also that there are many stakeholders in a project. Uh, for example, for us, there might be a director and an agency, and then there's us making the work. And then within us, there's all these other individual artists who all have opinions. Sometimes the agency and the director don't agree. We're stuck in the middle. One of them wants it one way, one of them wants it another way. That can be a real challenge. Um, and the solution to that particular challenge is well, you just have to dance your way through it. It's quite complex. But often the solution is present something that's amazing that wins both people over. And if you really double down and try to create something that they go, you know what? It's back to the same thing about references. We, but we can all agree that we like this. Great, let's all move forward together. And I'd say the same thing is true when you're working with artists. If you disagree about something and you have to work together, you need to find some way of aligning and sometimes that involves being generous and saying, well, why don't, what's the part that you want to, you want to do? What's the part that I want to do? If, you know, surely there's a way we can, we can find a balance here. And you do need to be strong and look after yourself. You know, you can't just roll over and say, well, you're fine, you do it. I'm, I'm not going to do anything. Because you should look after yourself and you should look after your own interests. And there are, will be times when it doesn't work. And you have a collaboration that doesn't work for you. And you don't have to work with that person again, maybe. Maybe you do, but hopefully not. But I would say largely, if you're confident in your own abilities and you shouldn't feel that you need to prove everything all the time, you can enable others to have a chance to show their skills. And that kind of generosity of spirit allows you to be a good collaborator. So if you're leading a project, for example, I wouldn't suggest that you say, well, there's this one really big complicated bit. I'll do that, and then you guys all do the other part. Because that's not enabling your team to do the things that they might you know, really grow from, or be challenged by, or learn from, or even be the most proud of. You know, this is a kind of approach I would take, is I would choose who's gonna do, who's gonna shine from their part of the project by learning the most or challenging themselves and, you know, rather than seeking glory, you know. To hopefully that waffling answer is useful. Um, hi, Greg. First hi. of all, like, thank you so much for sharing all the BTS that sure. went throughout um, this project. I was just curious to know how big was the team? Like, how many creatives were involved? Um, the leadership team was, there's a director, uh, Francois, who works with a 
different organization. There was myself um, and uh, Ian Murray, who couldn't make it today, who is the head of 2D now, but was the sort of compositing lead. There was an animation lead, as well as um, uh, James Sindel, who was part of the creative process. He's one of the founders of ETC, and he was helping with, with all of the camera work. That was the kind of top creative team. And then there were about, over the course of the project, maybe 35 people who worked on it, from modelers, sculptors, uh, texture artists, lighting, animation, uh, huge numbers of assets, basically, modeling and all of that. Um, so a pretty good sized team, most of, most of ETC 3D department, which is a bit bigger than that now, but at the time that was pretty much everybody. That's great, thank you. Sure. Hi, uh, thank you very much for that. Sure. Uh, I hadn't seen this video until today and I loved it. I wanted to ask you a little bit about selling something that you can't really show, like with a poster, I can just show it and say I'm gonna make it like this. How did you sell this just insane ephemeral idea? Um, you mean specifically this project or just in general, how do you kind of convince someone to buy into something that they can't see? Yeah, how do you yeah. convince someone to buy that? I'd say it comes down a lot to the idea of finding things that you can agree on that you like. So for example, we saw some of these, this Pixar zoetrope and said, we really like that, but it's too kind of gaudy. And so, yeah, yeah, we all agree. It's very just sort of uh, preschool colors, uh, but the motion is amazing and the composition is amazing. Okay, cool. Well, what do we like color-wise? You sort of align yourself through things that you can, that are exterior to your project that you can all agree on. And then I find sketches are really, really valuable because with good uh, communication and chat plus uh, a strong suggestive illustration, you can get quite far. And one thing I have found is if, for example, we call it previs when we do a kind of rough version of the animation or maybe grayscale or something, but the better that previs is, the more difficult it is to sell in the idea. You'd think it would be easier because they'd say, oh wow, it's, it almost looks like it's gonna, it's gonna be there. But then suddenly everyone's critical faculties get really engaged and they go, oh, you know what? It's not right though. This doesn't look like the actor that we're gonna cast. So it's much easier to have a sort of rough sketch that allows room for the imagination to fill in the blanks. So finding the right level of finish for your kind of concept sketches is useful as well. But concept, concepting things is very, very useful. And aligning yourselves on shared ideas, be they visual ideas or conceptual ideas, that you can all agree on. And then essentially you're doing what film writers do and saying, well, listen, it's like Toy Story meets, you know, Demolition Man and set in the wild, wild west, you know. So you're essentially using shared things that we understand, combining them and then arriving at an imaginary thing that we can hopefully agree on. Um, I noticed on top the hand was moving, mm -hmm. but... So there was oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. There are a few things in the, in the zoetrope that are technically impossible. So the, the hand would not be able to work that way. You would need to have 24 copies of something, but it doesn't, it has one. So if it was to be built physically, it would have to be a little animatronic hand that was moving up and down. The other thing, there's a couple of other ones, the train that goes around, if that was to be built physically, it would have to be kind of on a motorized mechanical thing that would move independently of the whole spinning thing. And of course, the lip syncing characters. Uh, so as we got into it, we tried to lay down all these rules and the director was like, yeah, yeah, those are great rules, but actually I just want a hand on top doing this sort of Neptune sign, so can you guys do it? We were like, no, it doesn't work with the rules. And eventually we realized that, you know, it doesn't really matter as long as we adhere to the rules enough that we can make it feel like it's, it's real, we can start to break them. Rules are really useful, design-wise, across all things. Coming up with a set of rules, it's like, this time we're gonna go for this. You know, have a sense of internal consistency within what you're doing. Thank Hi. you so much for your talk and your insight into the video. I just wanted to ask, like, 
like for your advice as someone who has like a lot of experience in the industry like as recent graduates like so many of us suffer with overwhelm and also perfectionism when mm. making our portfolios to enter the industry mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like what advice would you have for like us if to like overcome these sorts of things hmm. you know what that perfectionism will serve you well and you should look after it it's important to have attention to detail it's important to do things to the best that you can given the circumstance you're in. However, it's more important that you actually get something out because if you are paralyzed by your own perfectionism and it never goes out, then you really lose. It's better that something goes out and it's good enough than that it's perfect and you never get there. Do you, do you know the expression, perfect is the enemy of good? It's a kind of classic idea that you could spend all this time trying to make something perfect that it actually prevents you from making something that's any good at all. So it's a balance. I would say that you want to keep this sense of tr striving for the best that you can make it, but you also need to be practical and realize that there's only so much time in the day, there's only so many days in the week, and you need to be able to get something out the door. You also need to be able to recognize when something that you've done is good. I had a photography teacher as I was, when I was doing my studies, and we would put up all these photographs that we'd taken in the course of the week, and she would walk around quite brutally and just take them down off the wall, just walk around, just take everything down, take it down. And she'd leave one or two up for each person. And she'd say, this is good. Put this on your wall and think about why is this good? You know, get into the idea. You are doing great work. You just need to know when you've done it and, uh, you know, embrace it. And, and get that stuff out there, you know, so you don't become paralyzed by not, not doing anything to the, you know, absolutely perfect, because it has to go out into the world, right? And, and the other thing is, as an overall view from a little bit later in my career than you guys are at, you know what, everything you do when you're just getting started, you're gonna look back on later and go, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. You know, I look at my animation work that I first came to London, I was showing it all around and saying, hey, I'm gonna be this animator, and, you know, it's rubbish, you know, it's absolutely rubbish. And uh, mercifully, the people who were looking at it were saying, yeah, you know, there's some promise here. It could be good. You should keep going. You know, instead of saying, there's just no way we're ever going to give you a job. Um, so, it, you know, don't be too precious about your work either. Aim for perfection. Aim for the best thing you can do. But don't be too precious about it. It's just the next thing you're going to do. You're going to do another one after it. You're going to do another one next year. You're going to do another one the next year. You're going to do another one for years and years and years. So, you know, it's more important that you do the best you can at that moment, get it out into the world, get some feedback, see how it goes. Um, I really like the music video, and I've saved it. I've looked at it so many times, and I think that's one of the reasons what got me interested into 3D. Nice. Um, so I was curious in terms of if you're like hiring a designer or a creative, like in terms of portfolio, what sort of if it's a junior role, what sure, sort sure. of um, things you look at in a portfolio that you would be like, oh, this is hireable. It depends. Um, actually, ETC has just launched a design studio, so we have our traditional 3D animation and visual effects. Um, uh, division, the main division of ETC. There's a color, color grading division. And now there's also a design studio which is doing more graphic design based work. Um, and so all of these different divisions have, you know, looking for something slightly different. Um, I think we're looking generally for um, a good eye, you know, showing that you, you can create something that's visually compelling. And then there's a lot of um, specialisms within 3D. So some people are interested in more purely animation, the movement of things. Some people are interested in modeling and sculpting. Some people are interested in the sort of look and shading of things. So getting a sense as a junior for what area you might be interested in and then showcasing some skill in that area is always good. Um, 
and I'd say a diverse set of skills is also very useful because essentially the world is shifting towards, you know, we, we're having so many different things we have to do that your generalist skills are very, very useful. You can do a bit of this and a bit of that, a um, bit of compositing, a bit of lighting, then you show that you understand the process instead of saying, well, I'm only going to be a texture artist or I'm only going to be, uh, you know, a modeler or something. Um, so that's a bit of a confusing answer. So it's basically understanding the process and having an interest in one area, but not to being too specific about it, I'd say. Thank you. Sure. Check out ETC Design Studio called ETC Studios for the graphic designers out there. You should totally check it out. They're doing really interesting work. Right. Thank you.